So first of all, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, tonight I'll be talking about bygone Liverpool's research into the slave gate of Gattaca. And I hope you all find it interesting. And any questions, I hope I can uh, answer them at the end of it. So Darren White and I started Bygone Liverpool in 2017 when we first heard about the slave gate and we were determined to discover its true history. Our other discoveries include a 17th century witch's house that was on Castle Street and a Nazi consulate on Rodney Street, so it's quite a varied uh, research really. And we also worked with Mike Chitty to find uh, Woodcroft Park, the lost football stadium in Wavertree. But our research on the slave gate, uh, we published this, a free online book in January. So if you haven't downloaded it already, um, I'll give you details of how to at the end of the talk. So tonight I'm going to be concentrating on the local legend of the slave gate, the origin of the gateway, and the history of the original building the gateway came from. I'll be discussing if there's any truth in the legend of it, and also, finally, how it came to Gattaca. So I'm sure you're all well uh, aware of the slave gate anyway, but uh, there it is on Hellwood Road, right next to the bus stop. So the stone gateway is near to the corner of the nuke. This used to be the site of Gattaca Hall Hotel. It's now the modern Woodson Park housing development. In 1975, the Gateway was awarded a Grade 2 listing by Historic England. It's listed as the Gateway to the Gattaca Hall Hotel. And this photo is from 1975, it's from the year that gained it, uh, its listing. The listing does not mention its local nickname of the Slave Gate. Neither does it mention that it originated from a building in central Liverpool. And if you note, uh, there's traces of red brickwork that uh, could well be from the original building that is between, uh, just behind the railing that you can see a couple of bricks and they're probably from the original building that the gateway came from. So local legend says the gateway came from a building in Liverpool where slaves were sold in the 1700s. But how the gateway came to Gattaca was a mystery and so was the building it came from. All that was known is that the building was on or near to the site of tower buildings at the bottom of Water Street. So here's some architectural features. So it's made of yellow sandstone with traces of stucco. So that's a decorative plaster that you can see um, in different parts of it. It's said to be uh, for either from the late 1600s or the early 1700s. It's topped with a pediment. The three rectangular blocks on each side are known as a Gibbs surround, and they're named after James Gibbs, uh, an architect who lived from 1682 to 1754. The iron gate inside the gateway is actually much older than the, the gateway itself. Uh, that's mid to late 1800s, and it was probably constructed by the St Pancras Ironworks in London because they made the lock. And if you look very closely in the photo of the lock, you can just make out St. Pancras Ironwork. Here's a view, another view um, of the hotel inside the, the gateway from 1975. And behind the hotel is the older houses of the, the nook that you can just see the chimneys on. So the houses on the new dates are back to 1652. This is a postcard, I think it's from about 1900. Um, the rear of the hotel building can be seen on the right hand side, those two chimneys. And there's another view from 1976. Such a shame that it got demolished, I can't believe that it did demolish those buildings, but So here's how the original um, hotel building looked. Um, I think it was constructed in the late 1700s and it was the home of the Nicholson family.
So this is the earliest mention of the slave gate in Trent. And the earliest mention we could find was 1937. And it was by a man named Hugh and Arthur Matea. He was an architect and he lived at the house. But he first saw the gateway when he visited about 60 years earlier when he was a student. So this would be in the late 1870s to the early 1880s. And he wrote uh, an article, uh, a letter, sorry, to the Liverpool Daily Post. And it was in um, response to someone had mentioned the story about a ghost. And he said that this, he lived there and there was never a ghost. But then he goes on to talk about the gateway. And he says, the old, stains, the old stone entrance gateway, wrought iron gates, were many years ago removed from a site now occupied by tower buildings. They formed the original gateway through which the slaves were reputed to have passed into the old building before they were confined, before where they were confined pending transshipment. So it's, it's the earliest mansion, but it also encompasses all the elements of the, you know, the, 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 the legend of the, the gateway. So a year later in 1938, the house was up for sale. At this point, it was known as Gattaca Hall and had been the home of Mr. Littler Jones. I think Mr. Littler Jones, after he, even, uh, he might have killed himself in the house, I think. Um, I think he'd lived in South Africa and then I'm, I'm pretty sure he committed suicide in the house. But the sales notice um, for, for the house mentioned the gateway by name. It said, the slave gate, romantic history not guaranteed, faces west at the end of Daffodil Walk. So it's quite a strange thing to have included in a sales bill for the uh, in the state sentence. So this is how we discovered where the gateway came from. So the area at the foot of Water Street is a very historic uh, site. And it's actually the site of three uh, tower buildings. The first was from about 1256, and it was probably one of the first public buildings ever constructed in Liverpool. Then there was a second tower building in 1846, and then the final one, which is still there today, the, uh, that, that was erected in uh, 1909. So this is the area when we were looking for the slave gate, because we had a rough idea of where it would be, we concentrated our search into this area. And in this area, there's many slave trade legends were set in the area around tower buildings and the bottom of Water Street. The most famous is that slaves were sold at the Gordy Piazzas. But there's other slave stories are linked to tower buildings themselves. So we focused our search on the area from Chapel Street to James Street. And if you look under the word um, LB, you can see Back Gory and then Gory. So they're the Gory Piazzas there. So the whole, that small area of Liverpool is really concentrated for like um, slave trade stories. So here's an illustration from 1847 that shows the area we concentrated on. So on the left is Chapel Street and then the Church of St Nicholas. On the right is James Street. And I've, for the uh, sake of identification, I've coloured the area green where the original um, tower buildings was. But it's also the place where tower buildings is today. The colour, the Buildings have coloured pink are the Gory Piazzas. And in front of them is George's Dock. So here's the area today. So you can see St Nicholas Church again, tower buildings. But the main difference is that George's Dock has disappeared and it's now the three graces on the same site. So now I'll talk about the areas linked to the slave trade. So legends in the same area. In 1919, an old warehouse collapsed that was near to tower buildings. You can actually see tower buildings in the middle of the picture. 
There was a story that a slave market once stood in this area. So this is a photograph from 1919. It says, old slave market building collapsed, 150 years old. The reason it collapsed, it'd been storing too much, forced to store too much stuff, you know, because of World War I, and uh, the old building couldn't take the weight, so uh, that's why it collapsed. So why these stories are very unlikely. The numbers of enslaved people sold in Liverpool was very small compared to the vast number taken directly from Africa to the plantations. In all, there's evidence of about 30 people being sold at auctions. But because the Liverpool newspapers only started 60 years after the slave trade began, the true number of people sold in Liverpool is impossible to discover. This below is the largest known auction of enslaved people in Liverpool in one go. It's 11 people from Angola who were auctioned at the Exchange Coffee House in 1766. So how the slave trade worked. Liverpool's involvement in the slave trade began in 1699. By the 1740s, Liverpool had overtaken Bristol and London as the capital of the slave trade. In total, around one and a half million people were taken from Africa to the plantations on Liverpool ships. The ships travelled in a triangular route. So they started off by leaving England, going to Africa with goods to exchange for enslaved people. Then from Africa to the plantations with enslaved people to sell. So that was the mid, called the Middle Passage. And then they returned to England with the slave produced goods. So there was very few enslaved people on the ships when they returned to England. Uh, slave ship captains were allowed what was called privileged slaves. They were given a few slaves each that most of the time that they'd sell once they got to the plantations. But there were rare occasions when they would bring them back to England with them and then they'd be sold in England. So there were no slave markets as such in Liverpool. Instead, there were small numbers of people were sold in coffee houses and taverns. So how these stories originated. So the stories came about because of a misunderstanding of how the slave trade worked. The vast majority, as I said, never came to Liverpool. But even by the mid 1800s, um, people's knowledge of the slave trade had already, um, they'd already forgotten how the slave trade actually worked. So auctions of enslaved people occurred in coffee houses, taverns, brokers' offices, and the numbers of people were too small to warrant an actual slave market. In 1772, there was a landmark legal case known as the Somerset Ruling, and this helped to greatly reduce, but not to end, the sale of enslaved people in Britain. Advertisements for auctions of enslaved people are extremely rare after this date. Most of the buildings mentioned in relation to the slave market myth were built much later than the 1770s. So the most famous one is the slave rings at the Gori Piazza. So the nearby Gori Piazza warehouses are also the source of many local myths. Many people were told that ring boats on the walls were used to hold enslaved people. In fact, the warehouses were built far too late. They were only half completed in 1802 when they were destroyed by fire, but they were, re they were rebuilt soon afterwards. So this is how we found the search case that we searched hundreds, possibly thousands of old illustrations and engravings, maps, everything at Liverpool. So the area we concentrated on, we were very fortunate because it's a favorite for artists and is de depicted hundreds of times. So here's just two, but th there's literally hundreds of different uh, images. The one on the right, uh, the, the, the building on the right hand side is the old tower. 
of Liverpool um, looking down to St Nicholas's uh, Church. But of all the hundreds or thousands of um, drawings we um, looked at, we couldn't find a single match for the gateway in Gattaca. So here's how we actually found it. So here's an illustration of George's Dock Gates and the old churchyard. So George's Dock Gates is the, the front line of buildings. The old churchyard can just be seen on the left-hand side. The building on the left is a famous building called the Merton's Coffee House. And if you look within the red circle I've drawn, you can see a doorway that's identical to the one in Gattaca. But we had to be 100% sure that it was the same building, the same doorway and not um, just something similar. So here's another view. And this was painted in 1882. So it's just a year before it was demolished. And so it's the Merton's Coffee House again. And then you can see a better view of the doorway in the middle of the coffee house. So on the right of the uh, coffee house is George's Dock. What looks like paving stones that the people are sitting on and standing on, they're actually gravestones. You can see some inscriptions on the bottom left hand side because the the artist is standing with his back to St Nicholas's Church, looking over the uh, the churchyard. But the modern churchyard actually ends where the three people are sitting on the wall. After those, all, all that was demolished in 1883. So not just the um, coffee house itself, everything past that line where the people are sitting that was all demolished and to, to, to make the uh, road wider. So here's a close up of the doorway from the illustration. It's quite a rough illustration, but it's good enough to compare to the gateway in Gattaca. And you can see it's about as, you know, um, similar as you could possibly get there. It's got the three blocks on the side. I think it's called an entablature in the middle, but like a um, trapezium shaped, um, the pediment, the blocking on the side. So it's essentially exactly the same doorway. So here's the modern location of uh, the Merton's Coffee House. And as you'll see, it's right in the front of tower buildings. So it's, the exact location that all the uh, legends uh, said that the gateway was from. So I've drawn in red the original, um, or the, the, the shape of the graveyard from, uh, I think it was 1753. So the graveyard was originally much bigger and the, uh, the red block I've drawn in, that's the approximate location of the Merton's Coffee House to where it is today. So luckily, um, there's quite a few views of the Merton's Coffee House, but the all most most of the illustrations date from just before it was uh, demolished. So they wanted to make a record of it uh, before it was gone forever. And again, on that one, you can see another clear view of the uh, the gateway itself. And luckily, they also illustrated the uh, the main room, the assembly room inside. So on the left and right, you can see almost like wooden pews. Um, so that was from the original um, function as a, a, a coffee house. If you look on the left hand side, um, there's a, a panelled box on the left wall um, and that's actually the inside of the gateway that's in Gattaca. 
So it had a panelled wooden um, like vestibule as you came into the coffee house. And there's other interesting features about the inside. What looks, um, if you look at the back wall, there's um, a railing running across, and that was actually um, a musician's gallery. So they could have uh, music concerts, but also when, um, because the coffee house was used as a, a place of auctions, uh, the auctioneer could stand on the top of the musician's gallery and, um, you know, everyone could see. So the proof that the building is from, uh, sorry, the proof that the gateway is from that building it's not just its location at tower buildings, but it's also the supposed links to the slave trade and that building. So here's an advert from 1756. And it was placed by uh, a merchant called Joseph Manesty. And he was the employer of John Newton. Um, who was a slave captain who then became a uh, an Anglican, uh, an, an ordained Anglican minister who wrote the world's most famous hymn, Amazing Grace. But he spent 16 years in Liverpool. And this is, a, this is John Newton's employer, Joseph Manistee. He signed the bottom of the advert you know, uh, you know, to prove um, he's to pay the bill. And it's to be sold at auction at the Merchant's Coffee House. And what it is, it's goods for everything a merchant would need if he wanted to join the slave trade. So it includes things like an iron furnace, pots, guns, gunpowder, knives, but it also included 83 pairs of shackles, 11 neck collars, 22 handcuffs for the traveling chain, four long chains for the slaves, 54 rings and two traveling chains. And it's remarkable that that was being sold in a coffee house in Liverpool and advertised in the newspaper. So here's some bits of evidence that appeared in um, newspapers and print. So this one was written just before the demolition of the Merton's Coffee House. It says, the Merton's Coffee House is the oldest building of its kind in the city. It includes the slave market, a room where our, san our, our ancestors used to purchase their slaves. And he says, this is to be done away with. It's a pity, but it can't be helped. This one was written just after the demolition. The Merton's Coffee House must be forever memorable in the wider history of the nation at large as being the place where the last African slave was sold in England. And this is just one year after it was demolished. So this is in a book called Liverpool and Slavery by um, someone else who didn't write under their own name, uh, used the, the name, a genuine Dicky Sam. And it's supposedly an old advert that he recalled seeing. He said, many curious advertisements have appeared in the old local newspapers. One I recollect ran as follows. A fine Negro boy to be sold by auction. He is 11 years of age. The auction will take place at the Merton's Coffee House, Old Churchyard. So all that sounds like really strong evidence to prove the local um, legend of the slave gate, but it's actually a case of mistaken identity because there was two merchant coffee houses. In 1912, it was discovered that there'd been an earlier merchant's coffee house in Dale Street. And the person who discovered it, uh, Mr. Arkell, he wrote, my reason for saying there are two quite separate houses of this name is that every mention of the locality of the Merton's Coffee House down to the year 1767 is invariably Dale Street. 
So all those things, all those pieces of evidence I've shown then were written at a time where they had no idea that there was actually two Merton's coffee houses. So this is the first Merton coffee house. So we've got it back to 1720. So it, 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 it was at least in Dale Street from 1720. It could have been well there since the late 1600s. So here's a painting of uh, Dale Street in 1803. So this is looking, if you, if, you, if you imagine you're standing at the town hall and you're looking down Dale Street. So the building on the right hand side is the corner of Dale Street and Castle Street. And there's the Merton's Coffee House. The building on the, the next building down was the Golden Line. That was another famous building in Liverpool, probably the most famous um, in Tavern Coaching House in Liverpool. So the modern location for that is, um, you know the old Midland Bank building with the midded, um, uh, the midded front for the 1970s building, but that's that's the modern location for the first Merton's Coffee House. So that was there until 1767, and then it closed down. And then the second Merton's Coffee House was from 1773. So the second Merton's Coffee House, that's the one where the gateway came from. We couldn't find any links to the slave trade with that gateway at all. And it, because the existence of the Dale Street Coffee House was unknown, all events that occurred there were attributed to the second coffee house. Dickie Sam's advertisement never existed. It was based on a similar sale, but he had added Merton's Coffee House because it was in the news because it had just recently been demolished. So we were unable to find any direct links between the slave trade and the second Merton's Coffee House. By the time the coffee house changed its name, Merton's had already stopped advertising auctions of enslaved people. As with all coffee houses, it acted as a general auction house for every object imaginable, from ships to houses. So here's a description from 1867. I would recommend you and your committee go and see the Merton's coffee house in the old churchyard where the gentlemen meet daily to transact their business in full court dress, powdered wigs, three cocked hats, silk stockings, gold or silver headed canes, and paraded the flags in front. The room is nearly in the same state as it was then. That was by John Drinkwater. So here's a history of the second Merton's Coffee House. So this is where the, the gateway came from. So the coffee house was originally called the Bath Coffee House and it opened in 1755. The reason it was called that is because it had a seawater bath underneath it. It was erected by James Bonfield. He had been a mayor, I think, in 1748. And he built it on the area of the shore called Stringer's Rock. And this is what the area looked like in 1680. So you can see the tide, a full tide, the tide came right up um, to the buildings. So here's another view, and this is um, how it would have looked just before the coffee house uh, was erected. And as you can see, the uh, wall to the left of the church is the um, end of the uh, graveyard. And then again, the tide went right up to that and to the buildings and came right up um, to the foot of the tower and to Water Street. So to give you an idea of where the high tide would be today, uh, I've done this like reconstruction and you can see uh, why Water Street is called Water Street because literally uh, the water came right um, to the foot of it. It was originally called Bank Street because it was the bank of the river. So here's a plan from 1753. 
that shows um, you know a plan for uh, the, the building works. So the area I've, pint, I've uh, tinted uh, like the pinky colour that's Bromfield's ground. So that's where the uh, the coffee house would be built on. The green area, so that's owned by uh, the corporation, and that's enclosed from the Mersey, and that was to become an extension to the um, the graveyard. And then a bit further to the right, you can see the old tower and then Water Street. And I've tinted where the Mersey would uh, come up to. So using the illustration before, I've just done a couple of quick reconstructions. So in 1755, the Bath Coffee opened on reclaimed land and the Bath was cut out of the bedrock and it was the water was fed by uh, pipes from the Mersey. So that's a rough idea of what it would have looked like when it was first erected. So the Bath filled and emptied uh, with water uh, with the tide. So that's a rough idea of how the bath would have looked at the bottom. It would have had steps going down to the bath and then this pipe leading to the Mersey. So as the tide came in, the bath filled up and every time the tide went out, it cleansed itself. So it didn't need any pumps or engines to do it. It was all done by the tide. But what's incredible is that sandstone, because it was cut out of the sandstone, that will still be under the modern roadway now. You just would have filled it in and then, um, you know, built a road on top. So the second reconstruction um, is what it would have looked like in 1761. So this is during the Seven Years' War and a 14-gun battery was added to defend Liverpool. So I've given some idea what this would have looked like. But it actually came right around and then turned the corner into Chapel Street. So it was a line of defence of any foreign ships entering the Mersey. They could attack them uh, from there. And then in 1773, the Bath Coffee House became the second Merton's Coffee House. So there's going back to the original illustration again. So, and that's 1882, just before it was demolished. So in all, the coffee house had lasted 128 years before it was demolished. So here's the same area after those buildings and the extens extended um, churchyards were demolished. So you can see the roadway is so much clearer so much so that it's got room to have the overhead railway um, going across it. The original buildings would have spanned from where the edge of the, uh, the graveyard is, the churchyard is now, which is where it is today. It would have gone at least to where the tram is and the shadows of the overhead railway are. So the actual road um, width was really impractical and um, as the city was de um, developing and getting busier and busier, it was just too narrow for uh, the goods. And then there's an inset pit to here, and that's the same uh, road, but looking the opposite way. So if you look in the top left-hand corner of the inset picture, that's tower buildings. And in the middle of the road, um, I think it was till 1950s, uh, the Gori Piazza uh, remained there. So you can see just how much of that road was blocked by having the Gori Piazza warehouses right in the middle of it. There's only two narrow pathways, and considering there was an overhead railway as well, there's only two narrow pathways for all the carts and traffic to get past. But the original um, Merton's Coffee House would have come out that far. So it, give, it, it gives a, a, a nice idea of how much space was gained by demolishing the coffee house. And that's the same area today. And then liver buildings on the left hand side. So you can see how much space they gained by demolishing the coffee house 
and all the other warehouses, including the uh, Gobi Piazza. So now we're on to how the gateway came to Gat uh, came to Gattaca, and that was quite a, a tricky one to work out, but we, we got there in the end. So here's a, uh, a sale of the gateway. So in uh, September 1882, so it's just before um, work had started um, on demolishing uh, the coffee house and the other buildings. And what it is, it's um, the corporation putting a tender in for um, people to sell the building materials that will come from um, once the buildings are demolished. And it says that the um, the buildings to demolished will be numbers two to ten George's Dock Gates. Well, in the same year, Merton's Coffee House was then called then um, numbered number ten George's Dock Gate. So the slave gate would have been part of the materials uh, sold from that contract. So this is George Hunter Robertson. Uh, Robertson lived at the house in Halewood Road. Uh, it was then called the Laurels, and he lived there from 1871 to 1890. Uh, he was a cotton broker. I think he set up the first telephone exchange. I'm not sure, but he was also uh, an antiquarian as well. So there's a supposed link to the cotton history that had appealed to Robertson. The first sale of cotton in Liverpool was said to have taken place at the Mertings Coffee House in 1757, and the advert states, to be sold by auction at the Mertings Coffee House on Thursday the 16th of June at one o'clock precisely, 28 bags of Jamaica cotton. But as this, was, this happened in 1757, this actually happened at the Dale Street Mertings Coffee House and not the one that um, Robertson had uh, purchased the gateway for. So here's evidence it was uh, Robertson who installed the gateway in Gattaca. So the Gattaca, uh, the Gattaca, the gateway is not mentioned in the 1881 uh, Times capsule that was discovered. Now the time capsule um, was discovered in 2003 and um, I'm very grateful that the Gattaca Society um, let us see uh, the letters from it because it, it ended up being a crucial piece of evidence. Because uh, Robertson's sons wrote these notes about their home at the time of 1881, there is absolutely no mention of the slave gate in those notes. It does mention the other gateway, um, you know, that, that, that's the, the older gateway that's erected in um, Woodson Park. It says here in the middle one, it says, in this year, 1881, this old doorway again has been opened and the house altered. So two young boys have written about one gateway and they've written about all kinds of trivia in Gattaca, but they make no mention at all of a gateway that's supposed to come from somewhere where slaves were sold. And it's quite unlikely that two young boys would have left something with such a dramatic history of um, what they were recording for, you know, future generations. So that's 1881 and it's not mentioned. But the gateway was there before Robertson left the building. Because uh, Mattia first saw the gateway when he visited the house as a student and Robertson still live there and that must have been before 1890 so the gateway must have been installed after 1881 but before 1890 and the Mertens coffee house was demolished in 1883 so it's the perfect time frame to prove that beyond a doubt that the gateway in Gattaca did come from the Mertens coffee house So that's the end of the talk, um, but there's on our website, the Bygone Liverpool website, there's other research we've done 
that relates to the slave case. Um, there's a two-part history of uh, the, the area called Gory in Liverpool. Um, because it was called Gory um, decades before the Gory Piazzas was uh, built. Uh, there's a two-part story of John Newton's life in Liverpool. There's a, a very big piece on uh, black people's lives in 18th century Liverpool. And we also discovered that Benjamin Franklin uh, visited Liverpool with uh, one of his slaves. So um, there's plenty more material there that, uh, uh, you know, you can explore the story even further if you wish. And of course, the book itself is a free download. So if you haven't downloaded it yourself already, um, you know, please do, and I hope you find it interesting. Okay, thank you.